they think it's friggin broken you yes. know and they were hoping that joe biden would fix it whatever it is and he did not welcome to everybody out there in podcast land uh welcome to a new edition of the liberal patriot podcast i'm your host rui Teixeira, and every uh, couple of weeks i endeavor to bring to you the very finest in heterodox conversation and analysis featuring the very most interesting possible guests and stimulating uh, interaction that we can get. And today we're privileged to have Chris Steyerwalt, everybody's favorite simple country pundit. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, I think you'll enjoy our conversation. Uh, Chris is one of the best political analysts I know of. He's also a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, where I hang out uh, from time to time. He's uh, a Fox. He was famously the Fox politics editor and head of their decision desk when he correctly called Arizona for Trump before anyone else did uh, for Trump for Biden in 2020. Uh, this did not uh, go down well with some of the powers that be. And eventually he got canned. Uh, but now he's he landed on his feet. And he's, uh, as I say, he's at AI. He's at columnist for the Dispatch Substack. He's the political editor of News Nation. He does a media criticism podcast with Ileana Johnson called Ink Stained Wretches. Anything else I should add here, uh, Chris, well, to your bio? Well, uh, I we should say that uh, I hope that everyone will watch The Hill Sunday at 10 a.m. Eastern on News Nation, which is my very – I was talking to uh, – I was talking to somebody who uh, – about a job – and I said, so what do you think about the show? And the person said, well, I like it because, mm -hmm. you know, you're you're so unpolished. And I was like, oh, thank you. She's like, no, it's real. <laughs> it's real. It's real. I was right, like, all right. Yeah. So, yes. Well, you are a if, simple country pundit. Exactly. I was going to say, if, if, if what you're looking for are, are the – are the musings of a simple country pundit. I think we will deliver that at 10 o'clock Eastern every Sunday. Okay. Well, tune in for that, guys. Um, okay. So uh, speaking of media criticism, good segue here. Chris's latest book is Broken News, Why the Media Rage Machine Divides America and How to Fight Back, which is about what it says on the tin. It's about our appalling news media environment. So Chris, lay it on us, brother. How did we get here? Why is it so terrible and divisive? Um, you know, what's the deal? I mean, it seems like it wasn't that long ago you could rely on the news to at least, you know, be at least aspirationally objective. And that seems to have completely disappeared. Well, that's uh, I think it was uh, Willie Sutton. They asked him why he robbed banks. And he said, that's where the money is. Uh, mm -hmm. And the the shortest path to profits in the news business is political siloing. Uh, but it's also in intentional audience capture, right? So we used to talk about audience capture in in the sense of, boy, this is a real peril, right? That that a outlet, a news organization, would be captured by its audience and lose its real independence. Mm -hmm. But really, that's that's what people are signing up for. That's what a lot of organizations want. And just in in the in the quick history of it. The bubble that inflated around Pearl Harbor, basically, maybe a little bit before, <clears throat> but we had a period of stable, um, not quite monolithic, but but fairly monolithic media in America from the Second World War until there are different cracks along the way, but really till the mid nineties, and um, in that period where local newspapers were the the backbone they were the they made up the the feedstock uh of what Americans consumed in news and there were three big national television networks or radio networks and that was about the that was about the size of things and the a good example is the struggle for civil rights when and it was CBS uh, that that led the way, but all the television networks joined in to say, we are going to cover the brutality of uh, the apartheid states of uh, the American Deep South, and we're going to show it. Because it wasn't like there hadn't been 
protests before. It wasn't like there hadn't been police brutality before. But the decision in the 1960s to say, we're going to cover it and we're going to show it. And the what what do you think the affiliates in the Deep South thought about the evening news bringing fire hoses and uh, attack dogs and brutality into people's homes? They didn't like it, right? Mm, so yeah. it was not an entirely good thing, but there were good parts of it. And the good part of it was in order to maintain a sufficiently large audience to be competitive, news organizations had to appeal notionally, at least, to both Republicans and Democrats. They had to appeal notionally to both liberals and conservatives. They had to be accessible to a broad enough audience because everybody buys Buicks. Everybody wants to know about the President's Day mattress sale. Everybody wants to, so to, to reach that audience. Mm -hmm. In the 90s, first the rise of, you have, talk radio is a, is a, is a, forerunner, but then the rise of cable news and cable television in general, mm -hmm. and then the dawn of the internet and the market went from being divided into thirds into divided into a million little pieces. And the way that you succeed in a market that's a million little pieces is not to appeal to the broadest audience possible, but to capture and be captured by a narrow, intense, addicted group of consumers. Okay, so uh, Chris, that's uh, uh, well said. It's a, basically it's a structural explanation. It's almost like a Marxist explanation. You know, <laughs> the profit-seeking media capitalists are are pursuing their their venal interests, and this is what we wind up getting. Do you think any part of this is generational? I mean, people, some people have to be these journalists, and it does seem like there's been a sea change in the attitude toward. Uh, you know, how to do journalism among the younger cohorts that have come into the journalism profession. Do you feel uh, like they're just responding to the structural incentives or, or there is, is there something different about this, these younger I, cohorts? I, th I think that um, journalists, national journalists particularly, have probably always been left of center people uh, in the main. Um, and that is because of a variety of reasons. One is who goes into journalism? Helpers, people who want to be helpful. They want to do good uh, and create positive change uh, to what's the old saying, to afflict the comfortable and to comfort the afflicted. Um, that wasn't what got me into journalism. Um, what got me into journalism, aside from the very selfish love of seeing my name in print uh, and getting a little backstage pass to life. The appeal is, and this, please forgive me, but I guess if I could say it on any podcast, it would be yours. It's patriotic, right? <laughs> um, the, the media, uh, uh. there is no American journalism without Americanism. And we play an important role in doing that. But I think the, the, the helping uh, is a, a left impulse uh, more than a right impulse. And so that's part of it. Journalism is also more female than male. Uh, and that brings some political uh, consequences to it. I use the example of the energy industry. So where's the energy industry? Where do people work in the energy industry in the United States? West Virginia, Kentucky, uh, uh, Kansas, uh, the Dakotas, Texas. uh Texas, the Gulf, uh, Oklahoma. So if you started just with a sample of people from those states, they'd be a lot more Republican than Democratic. And then it's more male than female. So that would intensify the Republicanism even before you got to the question of why, uh, 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 which party had the policies that favored the energy industry. So where do people who work in journalism come from? They come from the Acela Corridor predominantly, right, uh, from the Virginia, northern Virginia suburbs to Boston, um, tons, tons and tons, uh, and it's more female than male. So even before you started with who wants to go in, helpers versus, uh, you know, earners or whatever, you would have a, a predominantly left population, and that intensified with the collapse of local media. There's great research about the counties that Hillary Clinton won versus uh, Donald Trump won, 
where's the media? And it's like 80% or something. It's uh, the, where journalists work is overwhelmingly blue America. It's urban centers, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing yeah, I'll say, shocker. which I hope yeah. is actually an answer to your question. Uh -huh. A cultural shift has definitely occurred. Um, we saw it at the New York Times. We saw it at the Washington Post. Um, we most recently saw it at MSNBC with the hiring of Ronna Romney McDaniel uh, to be the uh, to be a uh, contributor for NBC News, which is people feel empowered to express their opinions about the way that their employers are running things, and they. Some of that's great. I mean, it's cool, right? But that's definitely not how I felt. When I was a young reporter, I did not feel like I could go on. We didn't, thank God, have Slack channels. But I didn't feel like I could go and pin something up on the bulletin board and criticize what the editorial page was editorializing on or which letter from which senator uh, the editorial page had decided to run. So I think part of the broader breakdown of um, con the consensus about who's in charge here. Uh, and we saw it play out at the New York times. They tried to sort of put it back, have tried to put it back together. The Washington post has struggled with it. And we see NBC is still struggling with it. And I think that is a, a generational shift. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's dig into the, le this left versus right stuff. I mean, the story you're telling with what you just said, and there's a le lot of stuff about this in your book, there are these fundamental leanings or biases, if you will, that are built into who does journalism and where they live and what their political leanings are. And that's very that's pretty left. And we've seen that play out in terms of some of these dramas that have taken place at these big legacy institutions where lefty, you know, left leaning staffers feel they can basically run the asylum and tell people what to do. And there's a lot of pressure to only cover certain things in certain ways. I get that. But I guess my friends on the left would say, <laughs> to the extent I have any left, <clears throat> they would say, oh, come on, it's much worse on the right. You know, it's, it's Fox News. It's a disinformation machine, man. I mean, that's why people believe all this crazy stuff in this country. They are a weaponized, you know, sort of instrument of reaction that just feeds lies and, and distortions into the minds of tens of millions Americans, and that's the real problem, right? The biases of the liberal media, such as they are, are but a drop in the bucket compared to this, you know, sort of noisome creature that is the right wing conservative media. So what would you say to that? Because I do get that a lot from people on on the left, you know, ranging all the way from, you know, Marxists to, uh, you know, never Trumpers, really. I mean, th there is a kind of meme out there about that, about how that's the real problem. And it's really diverting our attention from the real problem when we talk about biases on the left. Well, the uh, I will quote my friend, the great Megan McArdle, who says, behold, the power of and uh, it's not or right. Mm -hmm. It's and and the um the soft bigotry of low expectations is a real problem uh, when we deal with questions of the media. And when I wrote that book and when I talk about media issues, I am very careful not to ever say, and that's why this is the problem. Because what that does is it invites the other people to say, yeah, that's right. They're the real problem. You know, we have a defining deviancy down issue in the media, which is the grievous excesses of the right wing media, right? Um, the misinformation, the the argle bargle, the trollishness, all of that stuff creates a permission structure for mainstream journalists to say, well, we may be a lot of things, but we're not that. And in fact, right, that right. is so bad that we must break our own rules in order to combat the wickedness of those people. Um, there's a great piece from a uh, NPR uh, senior editor or course, I forget what his title is, but a guy's been at NPR for 25 years. And it's oh, I saw that. I haven't read it. That was on the free press today, right? Yeah, yeah. it's in, it's in the free press and it's, it's interesting um, in a lot of ways. Basically what he's saying is, 
here's the the decade long slide into vacuum sealed groupthink that occurred at NPR, which in the 1990s uh, and into the aughts was an excellent mainstream outlet that was among the fairest, the most, like, obviously it's public radio. It has a left, it's culturally left, right? It's biases lie on the left. Uh, And that's fine, right? In the same way, the Wall Street Journal's editorial page, you know, like, yeah, okay, you can know it. And then, but the, the key, the phrase I use is aspirationally fair. It's impossible for us to be perfectly fair. We bring our own biases to things. We are ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, what we're supposed to do is acknowledge those biases and try to control for them and try to be fair. And this NPR employee tracks a decade of violating their own rules and violating their own standards of good journalism in order to be correct, right? To get to the point of absolute correctness. And part of this stuff, here's my experience at Fox. When I went to work for Fox in 2010, when I went to work for Fox, Fox, and fortunately working in Washington, working for the great Bill Salmon, who is actually the head of the Fox News decision desk. Uh, I I was, but I was, I was, but his wing man. (laughs) Um, But uh, the when I went to work for Fox, we were very insulated in Washington, right? That was like Chris Wallace and Britt Hume and the mm-hmm. swell gang yeah, of guys and in Washington. Yeah. And it, yeah, it wasn't the prime time uh, Fox News New York. So we were insulated from the worst depredations and degradations of the human resources uh, super fun site that New York had that New York was. We were a happy little island. So what happened at Fox was when I started, there was, it was a pirate ship. There was a lot of um, entrepreneurial spirit. If you could get it produced, you could get it on the air, you could get it pitched, you could get it made. And it wasn't like the other networks where there were strata upon strata upon strata to get a story approved, to get an idea done, to get on air. It wasn't like that. And that was cool. Mm -hmm. Um, And the on-air content from the news division, there was a lot of it. And it was normal, right? It was was normal in the same way that NPR was normal. Yeah, you could guess. Yeah, we know what the, we know what the frame here is. But Mm -hmm. the reporting was aspirationally fair. An interesting thing happened. After Roger Ailes went down for his many, many crime. Well, I, I don't want to acute why he's dead, but for, for all of the bad that he had done. Um, and Fox became a much more typical corporate culture, right? HR was present. Their strata came in, da, 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 da. I thought when that happened, ah, well, the on- on-air content will moderate as well. The opposite thing happened, right? Yeah, the- right. That's a very good point. Yeah. In-house got cleaned up. It got all tidied up. But what happened to what was on air? What was on air got more radical, more cuckoo bird, uh, less controlled. And I think this, I am not here in support of Wild West human resources or uh, a lack of protections for workers. But what I am saying is the animating idea of a news organization has to be the news. It has to be the news. It can't be uh, in this. And what made me think about it was the NPR guy talking about how the former president would talk about the North Star, that the North Star was uh, inclusivity and, you know, the lifting up of the oppressed, et cetera, et cetera. And it's like, no, the North Star is supposed to be the news. <laughs> right, right. That's what the North. That's, what, like that's like why we're here. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, I got to read that NPR article. I find NPR pretty unlistable now, but I, I was a faithful listener back in the day. And you can even play the NPR game now, which is, uh, I don't know if you know this, but you turn on NPR and how many seconds elapse before something is mentioned about race, gender, sexuality, or some other intersectional issue, no matter what the topic, ostensible topic is. Well, so, you, can play the uh, sa- you can play the same game it, whenever I have a rental car and it has Sirius XM. And go to the little news run where you have Mm -hmm. the different news channels. And how long 
play the game of how long can you listen until you get to the narrative? What's our narrative for today? The narrative Uh today is fill in the blank. The narrative is Trump and abortion, or the narrative is Biden and the border, or the narrative is blah, blah, blah. And you just choose your news. And instead of the, the wrong increment of time to think about the news is 24 hours, right? There aren't really 24 hours of news in the day. And what television used to do when cable news was young was they'd repeat the same stories, right? Mm -hmm. Top of the hour, blah, blah, blah. And a panda had a baby and blah, 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 blah. Okay, bottom of the hour. Now we're going to repeat these stories and we're going to update them as we go and we're going to move through the day. Yeah, plain vanilla. Yeah, and that doesn't keep people glued, right? Because they're like, well, I already saw about the panda. I know about the panda. So how do Mm -hmm. you keep them? You keep them by building a phony baloney narrative about what is really happening, something that is encompassing and inclusive of all things, not a hodgepodge of, because news is just a hodgepodge. That's what news is. It's a bunch of things and you can't build a through line, but to keep people watching all day, you need villains, you need heroes, you need drama and you need tension. And it has to be sustainable hour to hour because what all of these, the broadcast outlets want is addiction to stay and stay and stay because the way that Nielsen ratings work, if they can get people to stay just a few minutes longer than the other guy, it's not really about who's watching. It's about how long they're staying because if they're staying just a little bit longer, they'll get picked up by Nielsen, right? So the longer you can keep the folks there, even by just a couple of minutes, it shows up as huge increases in numbers. So the goal is keep them addicted, keep them glued. Right, right. And now it's uh, and it's sort of got this intellectual underpinning now, too. Right. In certain sectors where, you know, you see the economic logic of that, uh, of why that would be a good idea in terms of eyeballs or earballs or whatever and the consequent reward for that. But you had an interesting I mean, I'd forgotten about this, uh, that Jim Rutenberg wrote this memo oh, yeah. that was put on the front page of the New York Times at one point, which is basically we're confronted with this sort of existential crisis of Donald Trump, who's doing and saying this and that, and it would be awful for the country. We can no longer do news in the same way we did in the past. Comrades, we must take a stand. I don't think he used the word comrades, but um, you know what I mean? It's like, it's astonishing that this would be in the most influential media institution in our country, famed at one point for its objectivity and professionalism. But that, you know, that sort of, it all feeds together, right? This, the economic dynamic, structural incentives, and then this sort of, <clears throat> sort of belief, this ideology that we can't just do news anymore. I mean, you know, the hour is late. We, we must, we must uh, man the barricades. It's pretty weird. Well, one of the things that they say on the nationalist right is that people don't know what time it is. You don't know what time it is. So when you yeah, say right, like- right. The communists oh, used I, to say that in the 30s. <laughs> I, I was, I was, I was going to say, I was going to say. Was gonna say. Right. So they say, you don't know what time it is because we don't have, this is not the moment for following the constitution or being nice or telling the truth. It's too late for that. It's like, yeah, that's what the Black Panthers said. Uh, that's what the communists said. This is what people always say, which is, Now is not the time to follow the rules. Now is not the time to be good journalists. Now is not the time to uphold good standards. Now is the time to break the rules because what do we, what is the human nature is amazing. What do we always, what do we always believe? This time is different. This time is different. It's not like the other times. We have to break the rules this time because this time is different. And of course it is the breaking of the rules that makes the time different. Right. That's the that's that's the yeah, thing. And prophecy. Yeah. The root the Rutenberg piece of 2016. And it was written as news analysis. But the tell in it was it quoted the Times own political editor. And it basically was giving permission. Look, Trump lies all the time. Trump is a disinformation machine. We can't just we we have we have to think anew and act anew because of the threats that Donald Trump presents to the republic. Well, how'd that work out? Not very well. And then there's a bookend piece, and I believe it was also by Rutenberg. There's a bookend piece that ran this year, which is the war on disinformation 
We were so close to winning. We were so close to winning after January 6th. We were so close <laughs> yeah, to winning the war on disinformation because the government was finally engaged and we were going to stamp out misinformation and disinformation. And we we're so close. And then Trump and his allies are win have won. They won the war against disinformation. And I thought, mm -hmm. that's your job, New York Times, <laughs> right? That's what you're supposed to do. You have the single most influential n news organization in the world. You are the New York Times. Uh, and your job is to go report on disinformation and misinformation and report about it. That's all there is. There isn't that I th I think part of to go back to the liberal the left versus right the people who believe that the government has a substantial role to play in policing speech and thought. Right. So there's lots of those folks on the right now. There are a lot of folks on the right who want to pass laws uh, to forbid organizations, news organizations or social media companies from taking posts down. You can't you can't take that down. You can't take that down. So they want to they want to violate the First Amendment to force content to be published. Then on the other side is they want to violate the First Amendment to prevent content from being published. Both are violative of the First Amendment. And the truth is, if Americans are not, if we have decided Americans are no, no longer capable of reading and seeing things and coming to their own conclusions and making up their minds about how to vote, then the game's over already, right? Then the game is over already if we've said, well, we can't really trust people to make up their own minds. They're too dumb to sort through this complicated world. This time is different. So we're just going to have to control the space that in which they exist so that we can get more salubrious outcomes. That is un-American. It's against, and, and worst of all, it doesn't work, right? It just simply won't work because when you forbid information or the government polices informational spaces, does it make misinformation and disinformation less attractive? No, it makes it more attractive. It makes people say, Ooh, I heard that was banned. What, you know, Republicans talk yeah, about right. Hunter Biden's Let laptop. Me see that. <laughs> yeah. Hunter Biden's laptop. Oh, it was suppressed. No, Twitter did a huge favor to the Trump campaign by banning the post. It created tons more interest. The the CEO of Twitter was called to testify in the House even before the election had taken place. How dare you ban this content? The New York Post, I guarantee you, the New York Post got more clicks on the Hunter Biden laptop story because it got banned, not because right. it was banned or wasn't. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure that's right. I mean, this whole lot, uh, I mean, fundamentally, this is all about a lack of trust of the people, the honest workers and peasants of America. They cannot be exposed to all these wrong think and you know wrong ideas, wrong information. They can't make up their mind. They can't be trusted to discern the difference between what makes sense and what does not. What is, you know, mostly true, completely true, sort of false, mostly false. They they can't make those nuanced judgments. That's for us, <laughs> the experts or activists on the left and right, to to make that decision. And that's you know, I just find that so appalling. You know, I mean, as you say, it's un-American. I mean, in this country, we're supposed to be like a democracy where people are weigh the competing narratives about things and the different sets of facts or what alleged to be facts, and they come to their own conclusion. And, if, you know, it's sort of, it's, it's, it's an act of desperation to say the only way we can deal with this situation is we must cut off the spigot of certain kinds of information. And we That's must take right. whatever steps, comrades, we must take whatever steps are necessary to address this evil. We must, we must keep this, these dangerous things out of the, uh, and who's to make those decisions? And, and I think know, like it's just, just talk about a slippery slope. You know, we're, we're sliding all the way down to the bottom of a, you know, 30,000 foot mountain here. And I think your work uh, explains uh, a, a big piece of this, which is the shifting coalitions in the two parties shed a lot of light on this, right? So mm -hmm. uh, James Carville uh, and his uh, epic uh, interview with Maureen Dowd recently in the New York Times, uh, where he said Joe Biden's poll numbers were like walking in on your grandmother naked. You just can't get you can't get you can't get the image out of your mind. Um, but Carville basically saying Democrats are leaving 
the Bubba's behind, right? They're, they're, they're not interested in these white working class voters that were the mainstay of the Democratic Party for a few generations, for a lot of generations, in fact. And that as the Democratic Party becomes more suburban, more college educated, more elite, right, um, the level of discomfort with the proletariat is going to increase, right? That's that right, that's right. that's Absolutely. understandable. And as the Republicans left the country club <clears throat> and headed for uh, rural and small town America, and they sort of put together the New Deal coalition again in their own way, um, working class, some working class urban and suburbanites, and then super saturation in rural America, particularly in the South. Their mm-hmm. thinking is going to line up a lot more with the the the. What, what, what did you say? The 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 peasants and working the, uh, the honest workers and peasants of America, the honest workers and peasants of America. And so the, I think the informational attitudes of the press track when and what are the market pressures that they're facing? It all adds up to like, yeah, we it, it's time. This free speech thing has got real problems. Yeah, it's very dangerous stuff. This very speech. dangerous. Uh well, speaking of attitudes toward, uh, you know, the, the people on the other side of the, the track, so to speak, uh, people in the Democratic Party today, uh, as you were talking about rural areas, it was, it was coming to mind that this new book is out oh, <laughs> called gosh. White Rural Rage by Paul Waldman and Tom Schaller, <clears throat> which, um, you know, has really gotten a lot of play. Actually, I've, I've been somewhat uh, surprised just how you know much it's been talked about and absorbed into the bloodstream of, of sort of the liberal democratic uh, discourse. I mean, doesn't it strike any of these people as a little strange to like basically write off this huge sector of the population, which already doesn't like you and accuse them all of being the most racist, xenophobic, authoritarian people imaginable and the folks who will be responsible for impending fascism when it does arrive. I mean, this is all taken very seriously. I mean, a lot of these people don't bat an eye. You know, and I would compare it to the reaction to the book I did with, uh, you know, put out with John Judas last November, which has gotten far less play in Democratic circles, particularly liberal Democratic circles, because that's not what they want to hear. Well, yeah, what they want to hear is about white rural rage and how awful it is. And the, we, the good people, are the only thing standing in the way. That's exact, exactly right. And that's the uh, this is the audience capture problem. And this is about flattering and cosseting your own audience and telling them what they want to hear. So... You issued a challenge to your fellow Democrats, right? You said, we got to think it, we got to think about this differently, right, guys? We, we, we can't keep doing the same thing. Insan- the definition of insanity is uh, repeating the same behavior and expecting a different result. And you called them to do something hard and uncomfortable, which is what a scholar, what a thinker, what somebody's supposed to do. That book, and by the way, I am not the demographer that you are, not even close, but a cursory glance at the book. They steal so many bases. It is the biggest ripoff. What's a rural voter? And they basically say, ah, whatever we, whatever we say it is. What's a, what's, what's a rural American? Sometimes it's people who live in small towns. Right, yeah. Sometimes it's people who live in the countryside. Sometimes it's this, sometimes it's that. It's going to be whatever proves the case that America's real problem is poor whites living uh, outside of major metropolitan areas. And yeah, yeah. of course, of course it Johnny was popular. Of course it was popular uh, or got this initial positive reception because it let everybody off the hook, right? If you are a, and I, I think when I think of mainstream democratic culture, we're talking, yeah, about NPR. We're talking about MSNBC. Yeah, we're talking about the New York Times. We're talking about sort of that, the broad channel of thought on that side. And what these folks said to that audience was, don't change a thing. Right. You're great. Keep Everything, it locked. Keep it yeah, locked. Keep it locked. <laughs> just you're, you keep it 100. Yeah. You just stay doing exactly what you're doing. The problem that America has to confront. You do you. That's right. You do you. Because the problem that America has to confront are these hillbillies. And we've got a real problem with these hillbillies. And they're destroying America. 
Um, I've told the story many times, but it was so um, illustrative that I will I will bore you with it. Please. In twenty in twenty sixteen, I was at a grocery store, a very nice grocery store here in the Washington D.C. metropolitan area, and of course, because I was on Fox. It was cool because nobody around here ever watched Fox, so uh, no one, no one would ever, no one would ever uh, talk to bother me uh, right, when I was right. uh, shopping for avocados. And uh, this woman saw me, and she steamed right over to me, and I knew that she was both a Republican and either a, probably a lawyer, maybe a lobbyist, because of her attire. She had one of those huge brooches mm-hmm. on with an like an eagle clutching a pearl. And it was like okay. I got you. I see what's happening. And she comes up and she says, Chris, you have to tell these people that they can't vote for Trump. If they vote for Trump, it's going to be a disaster. And we were right ahead of the West Virginia primary. And I said, ma'am, you know, the holler over from the holler where my folks built their house uh, is a place called Windsor Heights, West Virginia on the Ohio County, Brook County line. How's the job situation? in Windsor Heights. Well, if you're really lucky, you could get a job driving a school bus for the county, uh, or you could get on at Rurig's Landfill. So not great. Uh, Opioid addiction, stratospheric, um, out of wedlock births, 70%. um, How's the church? Empty on Sunday. A disaster, right? So if if I went to them and said, don't vote for Donald Trump, it's it's going to be a disaster. What are they going to tell me? You're too late. (laughs) It's already. (laughs) You should have got here in about 1975. And you should have told us then about what were about the terrible consequences of this. The um, it is the back to Megan McArdle and the power of and. Mm hmm. It can be true. So like right now, Donald Trump's campaign and Donald Trump is threatening. When I am returned to power, we will we will turn the full power of the Department of Justice on the Biden crime family. We will we will they 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 broke the rules and now we will smash it. Right. We will we will now do it. So that's wrong. Right. That's that's a that's a wrong thing to say and takes America in the wrong direction. But that doesn't mean that Alvin Bragg was right, right? That doesn't mean that Alvin Bragg's decision to bring this hush money prosecution against Donald Trump was right. It's not either or, right? And what we, what we comfortingly want to think is there are good people and there are bad people. What there are are people who are uh, uh, Richard Thaler, the father of behavioral economics at the University of Chicago. I should have this tattooed on my arm. He said, we don't think that people are stupid. We think that life is hard and the ability to acknowledge that people who are different from you and disagree with you are struggling with the hardness of life, the difficulties of life, the vicissitudes of life um, makes it harder for us to empathize with them, to see them, to hear them and to understand them. America's cities are not uh, woke wastelands of Sodom that should be destroyed uh, with a pillar of fire from above. And America's rural, uh, you know, Windsor Heights, West Virginia is not a clavern of racist homophobes looking to uh, destroy America. Everybody should try to chill out a little bit. Well, I hear that, brother. Uh, But, you know, this is a good segue uh, into, uh, you know, talking about where we are politically, right? I mean, we we do apparently (laughs) have Trump versus Biden (laughs) again. And, uh, you know, how's it going to go down? How does it look in Chris Steyerwalt land? as this campaign is unfolding. I mean, you wrote an interesting essay the other day, a column about the uh, the Trump vote and how you thought, and if you squint in the light stem, you could argue that he's kind of topped out and it's really Biden who's not, you know, has the room to grow because so many of his voters don't seem to return to him yet, but perhaps they will. So talk about how you see the campaign at this current time and, and what are your expectations moving forward? So uh, in an average of the seven swing states, Donald Trump is underperforming his 2020 vote by a point, which is pretty surprising, right, for a guy who uh, lost so much in terms of public support after January 6th and was really, you know, really tanked and two years ago 
was a very open question. It would have been a very open question at this point. Is he even going to run? You know, what, what about this guy? So he's back, right? He got, he got him back. Right. There's yeah. this person. And I this should per- interject here, Chris, that yeah. your analysis and these numbers, these are about the absolute levels of support, not his margin at this point, but how many people right. are actually saying now they would vote for Donald Trump? Yes. Okay. Go ahead. So he's, he's back, right? So, and in a lot of these states, it's a 10th of a point or two tenths of a point. Uh, he's back basically to his number in Georgia. He's back basically to his number in Michigan. He is getting back to, as a share of the, of the vote, he is he's back, baby. And mm-hmm. and Biden, on the other hand, is underperforming 2020 by six points. Mm-hmm. Right. So what this suggests to me is and I uh, uh, a friend of mine put it this way, and I think it's a it's the correct framing for the election. He says, I don't I don't see how Donald Trump can win. I don't think he can win. But I definitely think Joe Biden could lose. And right now, what's happening is Joe Biden is losing, and he's losing pretty badly for an incumbent, right? Yeah, for and, an incumbent, it's dreadful. And his and the way that he's losing is, and I think Israel is a is a perfect encapsulation, but the border speaks to it as well. A host of issues speak to it as well. Who are the people in, let's take Michigan as the most effulgent example, who are the people in Michigan not ready to vote for Joe Biden again? Well, we know that some of them are anti-Israel, um, outraged. Uh, some of them are Arab Americans, Muslim Americans. Mm-hmm. Some of them are young voters. So he's got a left problem. That's for sure. Now, mm-hmm. we hear a lot about the left problem in the media, right? Because of all of the things that we discussed before about who's in the media and da 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 But who else is he struggling with? He's struggling with those suburbanites, the people, if we go uh, up the Chrysler, uh, if we go up the Chrysler freeway and we go and take a left and go out uh, into uh, Bloomfield Hills and we go out that way, he's struggling with those folks too. Why is he struggling with those folks? Because he, on the issue of it, if we just limit it to the issue of Israel, because he's bad mouthing Israel all the time. And he's saying bad things about Israel, and he it seems hostile to Israel. So he's managed to both displease progressive and Arab American voters, but also uh, to annoy the kind I, I just use the shorthand of Yunkin Biden voters, the kind of people who voted for Joe Biden in 2020 and then turned right around with no no hesitation and voted for Glenn Youngkin in Virginia. These kinds of suburban moderate voters. And these are the voters Donald Trump has the hardest time with. These are Nikki Haley kind of people. They don't mm-hmm. want to vote for uh, Donald Trump. But Joe Biden is making it hard for them to do the other thing, too. And you could say the same thing about the border. You can say, say it's about crime. We can go down a list of issues where Biden manages to antagonize both the progressive left and to displease the moderate persuadables. Okay, so that doesn't make it sound too promising for him. You did strike a more optimistic note in your column about, well, at least possibility that as the economy improves and consumer perceptions uh, lighten, that at least that's that would be the best thing for him, that that would ramp up his, his baseline level of support so that some of these other problems wouldn't, wouldn't cut so deep. And he might be able to squeak it out. Uh, that's it, still your your opinion? A hundred, a hundred percent. So the research is pretty clear. Voter attitudes harden about the economy at the end of the second quarter, right? So right. long, 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 yeah, yeah long, long about July one. Uh, it's time to people make up their mind. How are things? So we've right. seen persistent improvement, slow but steady pers- improvement in voter attitudes about the economy. And the most right. recent Wall Street they're Journal still pretty poll- still negative though, right? Still, they're still pretty negative. The most recent yeah. Wall Street Journal poll shows how voters in these swing states are feeling about the economy. And it, there's still 60% or so say the economy is, is very bad. But interestingly, how's the economy in your state? Good. Right. People how are, are your finances? Optimistic. Good. <laughs> I feel good about myself. I feel good about the state where I live, but the national economy is in big trouble, I think. So for Biden, and most of this is out of his, beyond his control. Um, And the reality is if 
voters have concluded that the economy is bad or stalled. Donald Trump beats Joe Biden by 30 points on who can handle the economy better. Mm -hmm. And if that's what people have concluded, that Joe Biden's a bust on the economy, it's, it is a sufficient rationalization for somebody to say, yeah, I don't like Trump. I get it. He's a bad guy. But look, this economy with, with in this economy, you can't vote for Joe Biden. And on the other hand, mm -hmm. if people feel better and they don't need to feel a lot better, if we go from a 60 percent negative to 50 percent negative, then Biden wins. But if we go from 60 percent negative to 62 percent negative, Biden loses. Or just stick at 60. Um, <clears throat> yeah, no, that's not unreasonable. Um, what do you think, though, of the idea that the pessimism about the economy, in spite of some pretty good indicators and people's general sourness on the direction of the country, it's not as directly connected to actual economic performance. It's much broader than that. David yes. Linker had an interesting piece in the New York Times the other day, and this is a theme of his recently, that basically people are reacting politically on the basis of their, their sense of how the country as a whole is doing, which they think it's friggin' broken. You yes. know? And they were hoping that Joe Biden would fix it, whatever it is, and he did not. And if that's true, then it becomes harder for uh, an improvement in economic perceptions to really, really right the ship for, for Biden, don't you think? I mean, what do you yeah. think about that thesis? It's a lot about the overall brokenness of America in people's eyes. So we, uh, we lost the utility of the right track, wrong track uh, uh, surveys quite a while ago, right? Because what happened was we got to a pretty uniform partisan valence on right track, wrong track, right? It was saying, mm -hmm. and my, my favorite chart is the one where on the day after the election, when there's this change in party uh, in the presidency, they just flip, right? The wrong track number stays about the same, but the composition, the partisan composition of the number inverts instantaneously. So right track, wrong track has has lost its savor uh, as a useful tool. But when we ask people about the economy, it mm -hmm. captures what you and what Lincoln, Linker was writing about. It captures just mm -hmm. what's the vibes, right? How do you feel about the vibes? And mm -hmm. the vibes are bad, right? The, the mm -hmm. 21st century um, has been a real rough run for the United States of America. Um, we have had terrorist attack, misbegotten foreign adventures. We have had a massive financial panic, a deep recession, uh, a corona, a massive pandemic, deadly pandemic. We had January 6th. We've lived in the time of Trump. People are yeah. down. Don't forget the inflation and, spike. And the, and the inflation that, that came out of, uh, the pandemic. Mm-hmm. And Joe Biden is 81 years old, and he is running for a four-year term as president, which is on its face preposterous, right? Like, what could go wrong? What could go wrong? Yeah, <laughs> what, what, whatever, whatever else it is. The so I have a, a thesis, which is that nations like people are always either coming together or falling apart. There's no such thing as stasis. There isn't like set it and forget it. We've done it. We're there. We're just going to hold in this space. And um, in the period from 1963 to 1975, it was a very bad run. A lot of good things happened, right? Uh, a lot of advances were made for individuals and groups, and we went to the moon, and that was cool. Uh, but net-net, this was a very rough run, mm -hmm. political assassinations and riots and bad. Uh, the vice president and the president of one administration resigned over separate scandals. Uncool. Uh, and then the period from 1976 to you can mark it to the Clinton impeachment or you could mark it to the Iraq invasion or 9-11. The next period is really awesome, right? We find a new consensus. People get cool. Right. Uh, Bill Clinton says the era of big government is over. It's like, whoa, right. what's go, you know, what's going on here? And America invents the internet. The world gets richer. Soviet communism is Gore defeated. Did that. Oh well, he did it. He just didn't <laughs> want to take a lot of credit for it. Right. He's so a all, 
all of this coming together happens and then all the falling apart starts. Mm -hmm. Joe Biden looks like a falling apart president, right? He is Mm -hmm. too old uh, and he is is just struggling mightily to do it. Donald Trump looks like a falling apart president too, right? Uh, Chaotic, uh, mean-spirited, uh, he's a scoff law. He is attacks the institutions that are supposed to sustain and protect us. And voters very reasonably have concluded something is wrong, right? Cause something is wrong. Something is very much the matter with two parties that can only produce these people out of a nation of 330 million. Yeah. Yeah. It is kind of a bummer. Let's face it. So what, what's the hope, what's the hope for the future? Uh, you know, how can the, can the Republicans, sort of survive Trumpism? Can they evolve out of Trumpism, for example? I mean, win or lose uh, this election? Uh, are there green shoots there that could put the Republicans in a different path? I mean, they are now a working class party, as we've been discussing, more so than the Democrats that appear in those counting sense. Their base has shifted. They, you know, Trump, for better or worse, he delivered a real shock to the mm-hmm. Republican ecosystem and intellectual underpinnings in such a way that you know, they re- they can't do things the way they have in the past, but they're stuck with Trump and they don't know where they're going. You got your freedom conservatives. You got your national conservatives. You got your hot and cold running conservatives. Where's it all going, if anywhere? Well, I think the the future belongs to whichever party can act normal. Um, there is a, a massive underserved audience for normal. Uh, and I think part of the electorate's frustration with Biden is rooted in the fact that he said, I'm normal, right? Yeah. Elect me. I'm super normal. And if you remember what it was like in the nineties, I'm like that. That's what I'm like. Mm-hmm. I'm a Clinton kind of Democrat. I'm a moderate squishy kind of Delaware corporate Democrat. And it's not going to be extreme. It's not going to be whatever. And I'm kind of bipartisan and I can, I can do stuff. And then, you know, the, the, in the, in the tragedy of Joe Biden, in the, in the story of Joe Biden agonistes, one of the key moments is when Donald Trump cost the Republicans two seats in the Georgia runoffs in 2021. Donald Trump obsessed with the the stolen election lie and that it goes down and basically does the most amazing thing he tells don't republicans in georgia well yeah whatever <laughs> you do don't vote oh okay yeah, cool right. and the democrats win two seats where maybe they might have won one there's a scenario in which like yeah kelly leffler is going to lose maybe in this race mm-hmm. she's kind of a weak candidate da, 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 da. Right. but they weren't going to lose two and they lost two seats and the Democrats got the Senate. And Joe Biden, who has an ego uh, much bigger than Delaware, succumbed to the siren song of the historians and the, the people who said, you have been given this moment. You have the House. You have the right, Senate. Right. Now is your chance. And much not like you, we heard, who, if not now, when, now, you know, when. It's and much like, go for it, brother. Yeah. The debate around Barack Obama in the two th- after the 2008 election and in the beginning of his administration was basically like, is he FDR? Hmm. Is he FDR? Maybe he's Lincoln. I don't know what's, but, but let's go. Let's say it's FDR. This is the moment. We've got a depression. Mm-hmm. He's going to make everything better. He's going to do whatever. And what did we end up with? Bubkiss, right? We ended up with health care exchanges uh was that the 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 Syrian civil war and health care exchanges uh that that was what people that, that that's what people took away uh at the end and obama succeeded in a lot of ways in his presidency but only after he got over that first part and this happens i think to both republicans and democrats but i think democrats are as clinton found out in 94 i think democrats are more subject to we'll call it fdrism and Joe Biden got a bad, bad case. He got a very bad case. And they came out so hard and so strong left out of the gate that mm-hmm. it took the, the, it, it took the midterm elections in Virginia. It, t- the, uh, it took Yunkin's win in the off year election in Virginia. It took other things for Democrats to say, whoa, 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 whoa. Why are we not talking about the infrastructure bill that we passed that is popular? Why are we still arguing about the Green New Deal? 
What's good? Right, what, this seems this seems bad. Held back what, better, three trillion dollars. It's hard yeah. to keep track. Why aren't uh, what you know? And it and it took uh, yeah. it took um, in uh, the New York special election. And I'm sorry, I've already forgotten his name. But in the or, old George Santos seat, it took uh, the victory of the Democrat there running on an explicit border. I will yeah, shut down security. the border. Yeah. We're going we're gonna to do that. So it's taken Democrats a long time to say, yeah, we actually, uh, I'll shut up by saying this. Mm-hmm. The electorate has been telling the Democrats where they are in 2020 and in 2022, which is we don't want Republicans, but we don't want you either, right? So the split decision of 2020 where Biden has reverse coattails and Republicans pick up seats in the House mm-hmm. was what? Uh, and the 2022 fizzle where the Republicans are, are poised for these big gains and they end up with a, what now is a one seat majority in the house and the Democrats keep the Senate, but just a little, these split decisions, the message should be clear to the democratic party, which is they don't want Donald Trump, but they don't like you either. And the future belongs to whichever party. I mean, look, if Donald Trump, the, If Donald Trump could be normal, if he could be not even super, if he could just be normal, he'd win in a massive landslide. If if somebody could put a microchip in Donald Trump that said, don't lie, don't be cruel, don't threaten revenge against your opponents, he would win by acclamation, right? But that's not going to happen. So we're, we're, we're back where we were. Yeah, no, I, I, the way to sum it up, Chris, <clears throat> something you mentioned uh, just a little bit earlier. I mean, what people are looking for is a normie voter party. Yep. A normie voter party. And neither party, in the eyes of the median voter at this point, is a normal, normie voter party. So they're, you know, they toggle back and forth between the parties. They're dissatisfied with one more at one time, the other more at one. But it's just, it's it, no, no real decision is made about the broad American electorate of who they really like and which direction they want to go. Uh, because they don't see the normie voter party yet. So, you know, it's, it's, it seems obvious to us, I guess, but it doesn't seem obvious to the people running these, these two parties. And of course, there's many moving parts within these. Well, parties if I, to prevent if I doing, don't, so. if I don't say it, I'll be remiss, which is the media mm-hmm. is a big part of that. But what's the biggest part? Our stupid primary election system. Our stupid primary mm-hmm. election system produces an uh, environment in which 7% of the electorate <laughs> has as much power as 51% of the electorate, and that's a real bad situation to be in. So if we could make one fix to the system that would do the most good, that would be it. That would be it. Reform, the, reform the way that these parties select their candidates would be the, the – the, if I could do one thing, it would be mm-hmm. to – get rid of these primaries and let them choose. I don't care if they do it by feats of strength. I don't care if they do it uh, based on height. I don't care. They can do it however yeah, they right, want right. to do it. But <laughs> the resume down the stairs. Yeah. Yeah. But popular, but the, but uh, popular vote state by state uh, or district by district produces and gerrymandering is a huge part of this, but we've ended up mm-hmm. basically with the Congress particularly where the only thing you're not allowed to do is be good at your job, right? You can't be an effective lawmaker. You can't be good at getting results, even for your own district, because if you get caught working with the other side, if you get caught doing a good job, if you get caught being normal, then the weirdos who constitute that 7% of the electorate are going to throw you out of your job. Right. Yeah. Well, all hail the normie voter, I guess. Chris, uh, this has been a great conversation. I want to keep you any longer, really. Uh, You've been fantastic. Anything else you want to add before we close it out here? Just I'm so pleased and privileged to be your colleague, and I just love your work. I love the Liberal Patriot, and everybody should subscribe. Here, here, Chris. I couldn't have put it any better myself. Thank you, sir. And, uh, you know, see you around the building, I guess. See you around campus. Bye.